This is a work in progress, so together with uh, Eddie, who uh, just left, and some other guys. And I'll begin with something which I believe is a kind of censorship in quantum mechanics. Oh, there are many oddities of quantum mechanics. This is a magical world. But there is a kind of censorship in which, which says that you can never observe these effects in real time. In the double slit experiment, there is something amazing going on. Yakir says, yeah. Do you hear me? Is there? You don't hear me. So shall I stand? Does that mean that I have to stand here and then everybody hears me? Whatever you say. Yeah, can you hear me? Finish my course, so I'm How nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> but now, in order to see Akil, I have to. Okay, I'll try to do that. Whatever you say. So, am I free to walk or I have yeah. to? Yeah, thank you very much. So, there is a kind of time censorship in quantum mechanics that says that you cannot observe these beautiful effects in real time. In the double slit experiment, uh, something very odd is going on. Yakir proposed his interpretation to, to it. Uh, other people will say that there, you have a superposed particle going through both slits, but you never see it, observe it in real time. You have to wait until the two halves of the wave function give rise to interference, and then you say, well, in s something went through both slits. Similarly, in the Aron of Bohm, you have to wait until the charge encircles the, the solenoid, and then you know that something beautiful went on. Similarly, in the EPR, Alice and Bob, they never know that something non-local is going on in real time. They have to meet and uh, compare their lists in order to observe non-locality. What is so beautiful about the, AB, uh, about the TSVF is that for the first time it enables you to see things much better between the pre and post selection and this is what I want to talk about. And then go to some of its implications, based, uh, inspired by the discussion that uh, went on uh, now. Uh, here is the ordinary MZI Mach-Zender interferometer. So what you have here, you are ensured that every, uh, every photon that came through this direction will emerge here. We call this C, this D. So it means that if everything is OK, all photons will go only to, to the C. It just, in terms of uh, uh, position and momentum, the particle retains its momentum, uh, its direction. OK? If there is any, uh, in, uh, if you are somehow spoiling the interference, then you're going to uh, get clicks at D. This all we know. Along came Lucian Hardy with an ingenious uh, uh, variation. He had many of the IFM and proposed the following thing. Let's take an atom. I call this a Hardy atom. Let's take an atom which is superposed between two boxes. It has been split according to its, uh, Z, uh, its Z spin. So here you have a particle. And it is either in this box or, uh, or in this box. It has been split according to its spin. And here is another. Uh, that is an atom. And here is another atom. The boxes are opaque for the atom. It cannot escape. But they are transparent for the photon. And then you run the experiment. In ma many of the cases, the atom, one of the atoms will absorb the, the photon, and you are done. But in some of the cases, you are going to end up in, in D. And this is a very interesting situation now, because you know that one of the atoms is in the intersecting box, and the other is out. You can't have both of them being out, because then interference will not be disturbed, and it will always go to C. You can't have both atoms inside, because then you will have no photon. You post-select for the cases in which you get D, and now you know that the two atoms are entangled. Either one is in the inner box, and the other in the outer box. That is, either one is spin uh, spin up and the other spin down. And what is beautiful about it is that if they are correlated uh, along the z uh, direction, then they are correlated uh, along the x and the y. So you have an EPR pair. You prepare many pairs like that. You give them to Alice and Bob, and you are satisfied that Bell inequality, inequality has been violated. So you actually cloned, 
kind of, uh, uh, you, you made a single particle non-locality into two particle non-locality, and this is a nice way to see that actually something non-local was going on here. Okay, this is, and here is, uh, here are the details, how you do that, and so on. Uh, this is how this experiment from which he derived some very interesting results. I can say that we, uh, Ellie and I, found out that you don't have to select out the other cases, say the, the cases in which the, the photon ended up in C, and the cases in which there was no photon, in which one of the atoms have absorbed the photon. Take all of them and you have a tripartite uh, entanglement, which is even more interesting. So you don't have to select them out. But let's do what Hardy is doing and select for the cases in which you have D. So do we understand? From one photon, we entangled two atoms that uh, have not been correlated before. We, we entangled them. So you guess what I'm, I want to do? Let's instead of, an electron, uh, of a photon, use an electron and place a solenoid in the middle. And now repeat Hardy's experiment. So here, your C is your D. Don't get confused. Have, have there been no atoms, then it would go to, to D because you're changing the phase. So you're selecting for the cases in which you got C, the, which you understand now, that it should have gone to, to D, but the, uh, interference, the, the inverted interference has been disturbed, so it goes to C. And now we have, again, another, uh, we have, uh, another EPR pair. But here is something interesting. The kind of entanglement here is somewhat different. You understand? Imagine, and this is what I said in the beginning, imagine that the photon was going in this way and entangling the two particles by going to D, or going in this way and entangling the two particles and going to C. You understand that this is as if I was having an electron which went from the other side. So this is what the AB is doing now. It is changing the type of correlation, of non-local correlation between the two atoms, which is interesting, and here is what Alice and uh, and Bob can tell, they make the experiment, and then you tell them at the end. You have to wait for the electron to complete its, uh, to complete its encircling the, the, the solenoid, and then you tell them, we got a C or we got a D. It's the most interesting thing is the case where, where we got C, so then they know that they have a full entanglement, and then just by doing their own measurements, their own EPR measurements, they can say, I ask them, do you think that there was, a, uh, the, that there was a, a flux in the solenoid or not? And then they will say, after they repeat it many times, yes, we can see here is the C and here is the D, and you can see that they affect uh, differently the, the, the type of the correlations. So this is something interesting, because we had to wait until the electron completed its encircling but what we did here is to have traces of it in the middle of it. Before, while the electron did not encircle it, there was still, apparently, I think, some kind of AB, which I think is very interesting. So far, we had to wait. There, is, there was an experiment in which there were some photons entangled with one another. But here, actually, what you see is that even before the experiment uh, ended, you, there was an AB. Of course, now the question is uh, going to... to ontological or epistemological issues, because after all, Alice and Bob have to wait until you tell them whether you got a C or D. But now there are two problems here, two issues, one temporal and one spatial. The temporal one is that Alice and Bob can not wait. They can be impatient and say, you know what, let's measure our two atoms. Only later you tell them whether you got C or D. And then they go in retrospect and say, aha, when we got, when there was, when there was a solenoid, uh, when there was a flux in the solenoid, this is the kind of, uh, this is the kind of correlation that we had. And when there was no flux in the solenoid, we got another kind of correlation. But because this, uh, because our electron is now part of the entanglement, you can say that what they got, the kind of correlations that they got, actually this is what determined whether the, the electron will go to C or to D. So in other words, we have a kind of three-partite entanglement between the electron and two atoms. So there are two ways to interpret this. One is to say that we had a chance to look in the middle of the AB effect and see that even before the electron met itself and gave rise to interference, there was something, already there was something which has 
uh, sensed, which was affected by the solenoid inside, which I think is, is an interesting twist to the AB. Or you can say that there was something even more subtle, but still the, uh, the flux is involved in this quantum mechanical effect. And here's another question which, on which I would like to go. Yes. If you do it in the middle, you don't yet know that it will sure. ever eventually come together. So it could be a situation that both of them go on one side and there should be no effect. So here's the question, indeed. They do the experiment, and it tells them nothing. They see that the correlations are somewhat uh, uh, unusual. It is only when you tell them, in this case, you give the number of cases. In case number one, two, and three, we got D. In the other cases, you got C. Then they are capable of slicing the results, and then understanding that there was an AB going on. So Use it. Nice. So, OK. But here is another question which I, on which I would like to dwell even more. And this is the spatial uh, issue. And let, may I return to the, uh, to, to the EV? There are two versions, as I told you, of the bomb testing experiment, one which Lev likes and the other which I like. And uh, this is what we, was our talk with, with Penrose. This is what Lev likes, and this is uh, the presence, the very presence of the, uh, of the bomb. The bomb is, uh, or the detector, it is on the path of the photon, so if it's there, it explodes, and if not, not, and this is what Lev likes. I like much better this one. This one says that this mirror is loose. And only one mirror is loose. This mirror is not loose. So if the photon takes this path, this mirror will slightly move. We can do that gedankenly, and then uh, detonate the bomb. And if not, then, then it will not move. And here is the great question. I mean, I am not surprised to see that interference is disturbed when the mirror moves. OK, so there was an interaction, and, and I got some, some information. But how is it that I get uh, disturbance of the interference when the mirror does not move? How could the photon know whether the, the, the mirror is screwed, whether it is fixed to its place or, or loose? You, you're expecting the photon to do something which is uh, beyond even, even the smartest photon can, cannot do. There is something here I find is the real mystery. And let me say what I find here the most interesting thing. In order to get this experiment, you should not, you should leave this path completely open. Don't put anything there, don't, uh, don't block it. So although you, you know, here's the problem, nothing went there because the mirror did not move, but you have to leave this path open. What is this thing that have passed through there? Yakir knows what to say. It is the modular momentum, which although the photon went the other way, it is non-local, and it is somehow sensing what, what was going on there. I find this perhaps the, one of the most interesting and uh, intriguing aspects of, uh, of quantum mechanics. I call it the, the you know, uh, in Yiddish we say, if grandmother had wheels, she would be a wagon. So in classical physics, if, if grandma has no wheels, she, she cannot move. What is unique about quantum mechanics, that if you have a quantum mechanical grandma, then just by virtue of being uh, capable of having wheels, even if she doesn't have wheels, she may sometimes outrace a, a, a police car or something like that. This is what happens here. The bomb could detonate. It did not explode. Just by the fact that it could explode, we, we are getting this result. And now I want to go to what? Right, 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 right. Yeah. Just a question. Um, so, I, you know, you can imagine doing this with atoms, right? That there's an atom over there, and when it hits off of it and reflects, it moves the atom, right? This is what we do with like the cooling, for example, with. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a, so, but I don't. I I guess I'm not quite fully understand what you're saying. Are you saying that? Because it doesn't know whether it's loose, it um, so but it reflects off and, and changes. Here's a mirror. But you take the scrolls out. Changing the momentum of the in, in the scattering, it changes the momentum of the mirror. In this case, you have a mirror which you took out the scrolls, so it's loose. It can move. If a photon hits it, it moves. So okay. So in case, the, yeah, in case the the mirror moves then interference will be disturbed. Yeah. But how is it that when it does not move, in, 
So then you understand that the photon took the other path. I see. I see. Interesting. Okay. And you know how they proposed some other variants of this in which you place an atom. Actually, what I showed here is that you place a single atom in one side. And you, obviously, the photon did not go there. The atom is changing from being superposed. It, it now becomes collapse, collapsed there. I, I can describe the, the experiment later on the blackboard. May I finish, and then, and then we, shall, we shall come. Maybe because a short comment why yes. I don't like this one. Go ahead. For me, 30 years, for God's sake. <laughs> 30, 31 years by now. Yeah, go ahead. For me, and Penrose, by the way, I looked at it. He is more on my side, but we can talk. OK, for yes. For me, interaction three is that something I know about the bomb, but I say my probe left no trace whatsoever near the bomb. And how do I know if it left trace or not? I have the two-state vector formula that you see here. So after the click in C and D, whatever, in C really, I think you need it. So I look on forward and backward. If there is an overlap, so there is some trace in the air or somewhere. So in, your, in the right case, the photon was in both arms in some sense. In the left <coughs> case, uh, the bomb did left to uh, forward and backward together. So the photon was not, the probe was not near the bomb. So just. The, sen the sense of mystery is greater, I think, on the right-hand side, but OK. And how did you know that I'm going to use your work on traces? It will come in a minute. So this is Yaki, and what he suggests is that against this censorship, that you can't see things in real time, just make a measurement, that, just take a pre- and post-selection. Make a measurement in the morning, make a measurement at evening. In the morning, you have control of what you're doing. At evening, you have to wait to see whether the post-selection uh, is the post-election, the rare post-election that you want, and then you say, wow, when I calculate it, when I do the calculation of the, the, the two state vectors, I get sometimes a very uh, extraordinary physics going on during lunch. However, this is now dinner, this is evening, so what we can do? Here, there, there is something diabolic in which mathematics is telling you that very interesting things can, may occur sometimes here, but then how can you validate it because it's now in the past. Here is, again, your censorship. And you heard what Yakir is offering. He said, make weak measurements in order to see what is happening there. And weak measurements are wonderful. But I have a problem. Here we are all, uh, we are all group which we agree that weak measurements are a very important tool in order to understand what happens between pre- and post-selection. Not everybody agrees with that. And may I play the devil's advocate and say, what I think it was, uh, uh, Pierre Curie said, or uh, Paul, who said, um, extraordinary claims of require extraordinary evidence. Oh, I believe it was Carl's. Carl's. Well, Carl Sagan certainly said that, but he may not have been the first. Yeah, OK. So <laughs> extraordinary claims require, yeah, uh, require <laughs> extraordinary. Wh what was I missing? <laughs> OK. Extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. Yeah, right. And here is a case in which uh, Yakir has made an extraordinary claim. And rather than using weak measurement, he used strong measurement, which is a surprise. This is a work by Weidman and Aharonov, the shutter slit. And they say the following thing. Suppose that a particle, a photon, goes through three slits, and then you get a certain post selection. Now quantum mechanics tells you something very interesting. It has certainly been at slit one. It has certainly been in slit two. It has been in a very strange negative way at slit three. But now what they said is that you can measure this not with weak, with weak measurements, but with a strong measurement, which I call a delayed measurement. And this is exactly what Hardy, without knowing, was proposing earlier. What uh, Yakir and Lev uh, used was a probe. They said, here is a double slit. There is a third slit. You, see, you can see it here. This is the shutter. Ephraim. Ephraim. You, you, I guess you, you did this experiment or something similar to that because I'm taking, huh? Shige did this okay, yeah, uh, Shige was in your, okay, but uh, what I like is uh, the following thing: you, you take a probe particle, superpose it, and then send it to the two slits, and then you get it back. Now here is what you do: you don't measure it because you have to wait for your post-selection. So you wait for the evening, you get your post-selection, and you say, ah, this is the post-selection in which I know that something very interesting happened during lunch. 
the particle has been certainly at slit one and certainly at slit two. Go back now to your test particle, see the kind of interference that it has, and indeed you find out, and this is something that Ephraim once said, I think uh, you made a strong claim. It is for the first time that we know superposition, not only passively, that you have to leave the two slits open, but actively it is the same photon which in some way pushed the, uh, the, the test particle together to, uh, in order to create the uh, kind of interference. The interference is an interesting one because now they are entangled. The uh, target particle and the test particle are now entangled so you don't see interference in any of them. You have to see both of them in order to see that they, they, that they interfere and I repeat, once again you have to leave the two paths open so you know that something went through two, two of them. So here was a case in which arguments like this, whether you like, uh, whether you accept weak measurements, I'm happy that, if you're happy, I'm happy. Uh, you say, I, I don't have to uh, worry about this lambda and so on. With all due respect and great respect for weak measurements, for those people who doubt it, here they, they have no claim now. What you see is a projective measurement, delayed one. This is what Hardy was doing. He placed two atoms and said, let's wait until you get your post-selection, and then you will see something interesting. And what we are proposing is do an A-B uh, experiment. See the two particles, uh, and then wait until you uh, get your post-selection, go back to your two atoms, and you will see that they have somehow sensed. Uh, yes. Ah. No, you see uh, the shutter, uh, Yakir and Lev said, suppose our <coughs> photon, here you have a photon, this black thing. This is, the photon. This, is the pho this is the photon superposed over these yeah. three slits. Yeah. It acts like a shutter. There is a technology now called quantum routers, such that if the photon is there, it is, it is reflecting. If the photon is not there, it goes through it. So here you have your target particle, this gray one, and here you have your test particle. And your test particle went superposed, you split it, and it went to the two slits, met the shutter, which is your photon, your target photon, and came back. <coughs> so here's the, the first time that you see superposition being shown actively, which I think is the first time in quantum mechanics that you do that. A prediction of TSVF, one of, among a few, that you can validate not only through uh, weak measurement, but through a projective measurement, although a more subtle one. And then this experiment was done, and you probably know this guy, Shigeki Takeuchi and Ryo Kamoto, they made an experimental realization of this experiment and showed that indeed uh, the, the test particle is reflected by, uh, by the two uh, parts of the, uh, of the target particle. Which brings me now to the question that I praised Penrose yesterday and allow me to indulge in memories uh, 30 years ago when I first met Dutu Yakir. Uh, there was a conference in uh, Temple University and Roger Penrose w uh, was there and he asked the following question. I have a particle, I have a photon going through a, a half silvered mirror and I have here two detectors and it is superposed. I wait for a while and I get a click here. So I had two futures of this photon before, before the detectors clicked and using a terminology due to the White House some a few years ago, I would call this fake future. Okay, this is the real future and I will call this fake future. Can I do that? Now Penrose asks some 30 years ago, what happens if I run it backwards just like we do in the, in the TSBF? And then you get not only fake future, but fake past. Now people may say, we have enough headache with this part, non-real part of the wave function, which just disappeared. Why do you now burden us with something as silly as believing that your photon came not from the source, but from the wall or from the refrigerator? It's, it's ridiculous. So uh, there is nothing here. Even if you apply time symmetry and the mathematics, it's ridiculous. Well, it's not, because here is the claim. In a history in which you have a fake future and fake past, and when they overlap, you're gonna get a real particle. So I'm using uh, Lev's uh, pedagogical device. I use the two colors, uh, blue and red, and you get purple from them. And this is Lev's nested interferometer. 
uh, uh, visualizing it. It is based, of course, on Yakios, uh, the case of the di disappearing and reappearing particle, and that was something really amazing. You all probably know the three, uh, the particle in three boxes, in which it resides with certainty at box A, resides with certainty at box B, but then it resides in a kind of negative way in box C. Now, later Yakir came to the, uh, the, to the following idea. Make some kind of, uh, make a possibility of the particle going from box A to box B. Then you're going to see something very interesting. At T1, the particle must be at boxes A, B together. At T2, the two boxes must be empty. It's not there. And at T3, it must again be in, in one of them. Why is it? Mathematics gave Yakira something very interesting, very peculiar. This minus sign uh, concerning the, the appearance of the, of the particle in the third box, or in this case, in the second box. What do you do with this minus sign? You can't assign it to the, to the charge because it's an electron. It remains negative. Yakir said, let's assign it, we can assign it to, to the mass, which is something which physics doesn't know. But in this case, what happens is that after a while, the nega particle, mind you, it's not annihilation. It's just coming of a nega particle, momentary nega particle with, with a, a positive particle. Actually, you have nothing there. You have vacuum. After a while, they separate and all lo and behold, from the nothingness emerges a particle and then vanishes again. And this is due, uh, this is a, so this is a theoretical paper that we published with Yakir some, some years ago, but along came Lo Lev and visualized it in one, what I consider to be one of the most beautiful experiments I have ever seen. This is the three boxes, but with a little twist and now you can see it spatially. This is the, the, uh, the MZI, slightly different, rather than going half and half, 50% uh, and 50%, you have now two thirds going here and one third going here, and here you have the nested interferometer. So you have now one third of the wave function here and one third of the wave function here, and you have three, uh, you have three detectors. Now you have to make an interesting post selection. You select for the cases in which D2 was silent. So it, the particle didn't go there, right? It could have gone only here and end up in one of uh, these two, D2, uh, uh, D2 and D3. You, you post select, yeah, this is mute, this is mute, this is the case. So this is the only history that you can think about. The particle never went on the right side until you run it backwards. So this is, uh, this is your f fake future, fake future. This is your real, uh, real future. But now you do what TSVF tells you to do. Run it backwards. What you get is a fake past, which is ridiculous. The photon never came from there. Actually, I should have said that uh, I omitted, I forgot to say that there should be another fake past here. But the, you, you agree with me that this is completely ridiculous? You agree with me that this entire branch is completely ridiculous? The photon never went there. However, by the overlap of the blue and the red, you get purple. And the purple tells you that just like in the shutter experiment, the photon certainly, the particle certainly went here, but for a brief while it existed within the nested interferometer. It never went there. It never came back from there. But it was Lev's comment that you should leave this path open that I said something amazing in ha is happening here in quantum mechanics. Now you remember, strong claims demand uh, stro uh, strong evidence. Could we now synthesize and take the work of these two gentlemen and bring it now to this extra, absolutely extraordinary claim? We said, why not? And we approached the two Japanese guys and we proposed the following. This is again the shutter experiment. But here, the probe particle is now superposed not only in space but also in time. So here's what you do. This is the path to which it never went. See this purple? It existed for a very brief time. I place a mirror here. I place a mirror here, and now I have my probe photon, my probe particle, going to this path when the photon never went, and of course coming back from a mirror. Then going through this segment of the path, the, se the segment of the same path, and then is reflected now by the particle. 
and then going again to the third segment, when it is not there, and it is reflected by a mirror. And then all of them come together, and one of them actually ref is reflected by your particle at the left. Now you have the par two particles entangled, and here what you get, Alice and Bob can decide. You are certain that if you, may, if you make a measurement, a position measurement of your test particle, you will find it either, you are sure to find it here, you are sure not to find it here, you are sure not to find it here. This is if you make a position measurement, and you can do that. Repeat the experiment many times. Or you can refrain from making a, a position measurement, just reunite all these parts of the wave function, and they will tell you the whole story. The photon will tell you, the same photon, the same particle will tell you, I have never encountered a particle here. I hit the mirror. I have encountered the particle here. I, I didn't hit the mirror. I, I hit the particle. I've never encountered the, a particle at the beginning. The same photon which has visited this path several times gives, gives you this story. Uh, we collaborated again with these Japanese guys, uh, Takeuchi and Okamoto. The experiment now has been done with very interesting results. And what can we make of it? Here I take exception. Uh, Yakir doesn't think like me, and he may be right. I'm not sure whether Lev, ah, Lev will say that the, you have the many words, so nothing to worry about, because you know many words absolve anything. But do you see that there is some affinity between the simple IFM and this case, uh, and the nested interferometer? After all, this detector never clicked, so nothing went there. But actually, Lev is showing you that he managed to do something with this nothingness. He managed to split it. It is not very far from what you do in the vacuum when sometimes you get a particle, a particle and, and negative particle, say, in the hawking Bekenstein or in the davis uh, Unruh, uh, in the davis Unruh case. Is it possible that in all those cases in which grandmother, you know, doesn't have wheels, but she could have wheels, there is an event that did not occur, but it left marks. Is it possible that actually the TSVF is revealing to you a world which is much more amazing, much more rich and, and intriguing than quantum mechanics and telling you that even such exotic uh, uh, things are happening here? Uh, Yakir is skeptical about this. I think that a certain generalization like this may, may be possible one day. What I advise is that there are several other experiments in which you have a pre and post selection. And y if you apply something that Andrew did with, with his engine and so on, what I, what I beg you is to make many, ne many nested experiments like this in places in which you say, hey, no particle went from here to there. But some effect has been seen, it is very likely that you will find out that this nothingness has been a pair of such particles, particle and, and, uh, and negaparticle. Yeah, this is a kind of philosophical comment which I use uh, without much success with Yakir. Yakir says the mathematics is different, so don't look for... I say I can't believe that God is playing different games in, in different cases. Probably there must be a kind of generalization. Yakir says, but the ma mathematics is different, this is a kind of philosophical argument, philosophical argument that I make. Uh, you have to wait for an eclipse to see light bending near the sun. It doesn't mean that there is no, light is not bending when there is no eclipse. So it perhaps the post-selection is actually telling you this is the case in which you can observe it, but it, it happens in, uh, in other cases. Perhaps we can generalize it, perhaps not. This is an open issue. These are some of our papers. We used to thank Yakir for his inspiration and for his devotion and love throughout these years, but it is about time that we thank a no less important person. I wish to thank Nili for being the real hero for many years in, in this, for being Yakir's wife and for being there for him. I was so thrilled when you two visited me and we went to this Bedrian guy and you and Nili uh, were holding this kid. Thank both of you, Nili and Yakir. Thank you very much.
Ah, this is not physics. This is the. Shall I translate what Yakir is saying? He said that there was a Bedouin shepherd ne next to my house in the village. And Nili said she wants to see a kid. And then when she appeared there, the females gave birth one after another. And the Bedouin guy said, I've never seen such a thing. Two men came with a woman, and she looked at the, at the, at the sheep and the goats, and they began giving birth one after another with another magic. Yes. Yakir, yeah, you probably have a comment or question or. Okay. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. We have a paper with Lee Smolin, and it's ve it's a very interesting paper with Yakir and Lee Smolin. And the, okay. the pa you have two atoms which never interacted with, uh, but it's relevant. You have two atoms, one excited, one ground, which uh, may exchange a photon, and they become entangled. But then there is some paradox there. We called it the quantum liar paradox. In some of the cases, it turns out that the excited atom has remained excited and the uh, ground atom has remained ground, so apparently they could not have exchanged a photon. But then, by Bell's inequality, the very fact that they have never, ex uh, and never been entangled, entangled is due to entanglement. Because actually, and, and this is where I think that a nested uh, interferometer may reveal the presence of a particle and negative particle. Uh, they are entangled. The fact that this atom, the uh, excited atom, has remained excited is due to, uh, b uh, to uh, EPR entanglement with the other one. So there is something paradoxical in it. Not, uh, not very disturbing, but something to think uh, about. Harvey, can yes. you show the, uh, the nested interferometer here? The what? Yes. The sure, sure. Uh, wait, this, this way. Here is, uh, here, is, here is your nested. The, yeah, the purple one, yes. The way that you saw it there, it looks as if there was nothing moving in the empty space between the two of them, right? And then I can prove by using weak, weak value that it's a projection operator for positive particles and projection operator for negative particles moving together in the empty arms, and then they split. The positive one goes one way, and you don't see that in the other way there is a negative one there. And that's what happens. So there is no mystery there. It's not that there was nothing there, but actually, and then we can see that it was supposed that photon had some wave function, some tension. Again, it appears in the nested interferometer inside only after the right time and with the same shape that it was in the beginning. The only way to explain it is that there were two wave packets moving together, so positive and negative photon. They had the same shape, and that's why when they split after the right time, you see these shapes moving inside the nested interferometer. Otherwise, it would really be a mystery. Why, why did you have to wait that time? Why did they keep the same shape? Have you heard what the man said? He said, there is nothing mysterious here. <laughs> this is what he said just now. You have, I mean, a probe particle shows you that it didn't encounter anything here. It didn't encounter anything here. So it went through. It went through. The box was empty. It went through it. And it, it went through, hit a mirror. So it didn't encounter a particle there. And you think that there is nothing surprising in it because, yeah, I have an explanation for it. Let, let me explain what I say. It's very it is surprising. Uh, Yakir, it is surprising. People are surprised. Could I yes. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Suppose you have two cavities, and a particle can go back and forth between the two cavities. Now, the question, if you find the particle in one cavity, you can tell something not only about the future, but also about the past. You can tell 
you can say that in the past, there was a time when the particle had a definite value from, if you think about spin, you have a spin that has positive value in the particle in the left box, and negative value in the particle in the right box. When the particle is superposition between the two boxes, you can think about another component of the spin. That sigma x value the part is the left plus the right box. Now, that you can't see because you can't observe the spin, the that spin, because it's a non local statement. But you can observe it later when it becomes a localized. So there is a situation in which we have some observable that you can't see locally now, but you will see it locally later. In fact, in every experiment that is done in the laboratory, for example, you stare, the cell when you have a collision of two, uh, two protons, and, and you get now a huge number of particles coming out. You never observe the particles just when they left. You, you rely on the fact that they were moving freely for some time, and then when you check the position later, you can infer from it what was the momentum earlier. So the fact that you can infer from it, infer, infer it only from the future, doesn't mean that there was really there something no locally that you could not see. That is the situation here. There are two particles moving there, positive and negative. You can't see locally what's going on there, but from the fact that you see later the whole street, you know that they are moving before, with a non-local information that you could not see no. There's nothing mysterious. No, nothing mysterious. I would say that it is, uh, uh, there is one thing I want to say. When Dirac found by, by his uh, equation that there should be an electron with a positive charge, people told him forget about it, don't publish it, and then he did that, and then Anderson discovered the, the positron. You think that there is nothing mysterious in the fact that you decided to trust the mathematics, which nobody ever did, and say there is an ontology there. Uh, it will take me some years, 5, 10, 20 years, until I will get used to it that you added to physics something so uh, no less important than the, uh, the, the antiparticles. Now you have particles, antiparticles, and a whole world of negative particles. I find, I, I, you find that there is nothing strange in it. Uh, it will take me some years to, to absorb it. Um, it. But one day I may say that there is nothing mysterious. I'm not there yet. Just uh, I, lest it turns out that I don't think much of uh, weak measurements, in this experiment there is something very important that you can do only in weak measurements. Make a weak measurement on this mirror and you will find out uh, it's, it's a separate experiment. When you get this post selection you will find out, Andrew, that this mirror has not been pushed but pulled. So then you can again say what you say to Yakir, it's different and so on, but will you, will you agree with me that there is something very beautiful here? That it is not just playing with noise, but there is something very consistent. I find it very beautiful indeed. I think it's amazing. So remember this, when you talk about weak measurements, think about this because I think that, I believe that there is a new physics here. You have something hitting, hitting a mirror. Has an experiment like this been done, Yakir? Is it, is, is it feasible? Say, um, I know that you mean that the net, the didn't explain. It's you right. That the right mirror it took alpha, yes, and the left, the left mirror it took fever. Yes, uh, and yeah. sometimes it, it gets a too a strong kick in order to, to get you the, 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 the right momentum, so this compensates it. But I find this wonderful, and this you get with weak measurements. I think there's a sort of transcendent beauty about yeah, it. Yeah, there is, there is a branch called optomechanics, yeah. some uh, quote and some others. There are some laboratories that... I know there was proposed by some German. Wow, yeah. Optomechanics, something good. Yes. I'm, I'm
Yeah, which is like the yes. mega. Yes, yes. So it is related. Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay, so. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So you can augment, I mean, TSVF, you can augment it with both weak and projective measurements. You say TSVF, nobody knows what you mean. Two days yeah, I thought that after three days, you know, TSVF means the two-state vector formalism. This is what Yakir is, is doing for the, for the last 30 years and for which we are so much indebted to him. <laughs>